So here we go. So I'm Daphna Lemish. I'm the interim dean of the School of, Communi of Communication Information. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I think I know most of the people here, which is great. Um, and welcome to this special celebration, one of the events of our 40th anniversary uh, celebration of the school in its uh, current configuration. As you know, we have three departments, Department of Communication, Department of Journalism and Media Studies, and the Department of Library Information Science. So this is the current configuration for the last 40 years. And we had several events and there is, we can't think of a better celebration than to actually hear from our alumni. This is what we're for. And our alumni um, accomplishments and career paths and um, you know everything that you've been doing is such an interest for us and such a source of pride for the school. So for that purpose, we convened some of our alums uh, to share with us their career path. We have people from different disciplines, different paths, different continents even that we're gonna hear from. And it is my pleasure to invite um, Steve Miller, our program director of the journalism and media studies and adore the iconic uh, instructor who transformed the lives of so many of the alumni on this call and others around the world uh, to present our panelists and to moderate the conversation. I'm eager to learn from all of you. I welcome you. I thank the panelists for being with us. And Steve, take it from here. Thank you, Daphne. I really appreciate that. First of all, um, I want to thank you and Brenda for inviting me to do this. This is quite an honor. Um, I'm one of the few people here who's been fortunate enough to have served at, at Sky under every single dean. And they've all been a marvelous bunch. And in fact, we're, I'm very pleased to see that one of our Dean Emeriti, uh, Gus Friedrich is with us and uh, LIS partner chair Emeriti, uh, Betty Turok is also here. And I wanna thank them for being here. And it's just wonderful to see them. Um, Betty was here when I started back here, working here. And it, 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 it was always wonderful working with her. Um, Alumni are the backbone of our school, the, uh, just as the students are the ones that we should be serving. And when our alumni su succeed in their careers, uh, we succeed because it shows that um, what we're doing is working and it's just an honor and a privilege to be here um, with these people uh, today. And I'm going to introduce them to you. And they, have come from, they are coming to us thank, thanks to Zoom from far and wide um, to be here with you tonight. So uh, first I'd like to introduce uh, Lauren Indeberry Clark. She's the Director of Communications at General Motors Strategic Markets Alliance and Distributors um, based in Australia. Uh, Lauren helps oversee strategic planning for General Motors global growth strategy, launch activities, and internal and executive communications for products and teams globally. Her experience spans the automotive consumer health lifestyle, product and brand, social media and crisis sectors, and she has worked at some of the world's largest PR agencies. At GM, Lauren has held communications positions in financial, regional, grassroots, manufacturing and global product and brand. Highlights include the first drives of the Chevro Chevrolet Volt, support for the GM IPO, investment announcement for the Fairfax assembly plant, and the global launch of the Buick Avenir concept and Buick Env en Envision. She has helped launch vehicles all over the world. Lauren is passionate about maternal and child health and holds volunteer positions on committees at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia, where she lives. And she is a mum, mum, say it the right way, to three young children. Lauren, thank you for being here. It's, it's, it's an honor to have you come all this way for us. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. Mike Emanuel. Uh, Mike is the chief Washington correspondent um, and Fox News Live anchor at the Fox News Channel and a native of Westfield, New Jersey. I have to say that being a person who came from, who grew up in Roselle, um, <laughs> right, right nearby. Uh, Mike Emanuel has covered many top news events over the past quarter century across the country and around the globe. He has served as national security correspondent, White House correspondent, and chief congressional correspondent. A month after starting at Fox News, he was in London reporting live on the death of Princess Diana. He landed exclusive interviews with George W. Bush, covered the 2000 presidential campaign, provided hourly updates from Washington on September 11, 2001, covered the buildup to the war in Afghanistan from Pakistan, 
and was embedded with the 10th Mountain Division soldiers in Baghdad, Iraq, as American soldiers protected the Iraq Iraqi election. He traveled the world on Air Force One with Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama. I'm proud to say that Mike is also a Rutgers 250 fellow. He's one of five from journalism and media studies grads to be so honored and, and a Sky Distinguished alumnus. He and his wife are the proud parents of high schoolers, Savas and Tess, and he's a wonderful person and a good friend. Hi, Mike. Steve, thank you so much for the warm welcome. I'm honored to be here. Nicole A. Cook is the Augusta Baker Endowed Chair and Associate Professor at the School of Information Science at the University of South Carolina. Her research and teaching interests include human information behavior, fake news consumption and resistance, critical cultural information studies, and diversity and social justice and librarianship. She is the founding editor of, of ALA Neil Schumann's Critical Culture Information Studies book series and has published numerous articles and book chapters. Her books include Information Services to Diverse Populations, Fake News and Alternative Facts, Information Literacy in a Post-Truth Era, and Foundations of Social Justice. She is the recipient of the 2007 Library Journal Mover and Shaker Award, the 2016 American Library Association Equality Award, the 2017 ALA Achievement in Library Diversity Research Award, the Illinois Library Association's 2019 Intellectual Freedom Award in recognition of her work in combating online hate and bullying in library and information science, and the Association Information Science Education's 2019 Excellence in Teaching Award. In 2021, she was presented with the Martin Luther King Social Justice Award by the University of South Carolina. In addition to her three Russian, Russian good Rutgers degrees, she holds an MED in adult education from Penn State. Um, I also, in addition to that, I just want to applaud all that the ALA is doing um, to combat um, the heinous um, book bannings that have been happening all over the country right now. And I'm sure that Nicole is playing a large part in that. So welcome, Nicole. Thanks so much. Great to be here. I'm correct with that. Am, am I correct that you're part of that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Right, because um, it's. I know that they you just had the uh, con they just had the uh, book awards in New York, and that was a big topic, and mm -hmm. it was even covered by NPR. Yeah. So, so thank you for coming. Really appreciate that. Always, always mm -hmm. welcome. Always running to come back home to Rutgers, so it's great to be here. Ron Jantz began his professional career at AT and T Bell Labs, where he worked for many years as a software developer and manager of product development for business communication systems. In 1996, he took a buyout from AT and T and entered the MLS program at the Rutgers School of Communication Information Library Studies. After graduating with the MLS, excuse me, <coughs> MLS. Ron joined Rutgers University Libraries, where he served in the role of social science data librarian and digital library architect. During his 20 year service at the library, Ron also earned a PhD from the School of Communication and Information, in which he studied innovation in nonprofit groups. This work led to the publication of his book, Managing Creativity, the Innovation Research Library. Ron is a member of the Lib American Library Association and the New Jersey Library Association. and. Most importantly, as far as I'm concerned, he serves to, right now as the president of the School of Communication Information Alumni Association. Ron, welcome again. Yes, thank you, Steve. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's always nice to see you. And that last, but certainly not least, my friend and buddy, Rosie Kasika. Um, just so you know, Rose, in addition to everything I'm going to read about Rosie, Rosie's been a great connection for our students and providing them with internships over the years. And I can't thank her enough for all she's done for uh, journalism and media studies majors. Um, at the moment, she's the business administration manager at CNN Worldwide. She manages a team of talent executive assistants who provide administration, administrative support to CNN's New York anchors. Previously, she was a senior broadcast producer at CNN HLN's Crime and Justice with Ashley Banfield and HLN's long running crime show, Nancy Grace. Before that, she was a producer at CNN Financial News. She started working in television covering business news at Dow Jones Wall Street Journal Group and received her BA from Rutgers and her MA from New York University. She is a member of the Society for Professional Journalists from New York, film, New York Women in Film and Television. And I've also worked with her because she is a mentor for the Allison R. Bernstein Media Mentoring Program through the um, Institute of Women's Leadership over on the Douglas campus. She also created the Mario Pinho and Mario Te 
of, I'll say it right, Tequas, Memorial Endowed Scholarship for first generation students enrolled in journalism and media studies at Sky. It was created to honor a father and godfather. And I can honestly say being involved with awarding this scholarship that has helped students stay in school because of her generosity. So, hey Rose. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. I just want to say I'm also from Union County too. Just hey. want to let you and Mike know that. What, what I grew town? up in Elizabeth. <laughs> so beautiful. But, hey, my next door neighbor, Elizabeth. Yeah, there you go. So. Morris County. <laughs> oh, we're gonna get involved get involved in this now. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask our wonderful guests to um, tell you about how they got to where they are in their career, and then after that, um, we'll have a nice Q&A, um, and we're going to start with Lauren. Um, I will be brief. I, um, I'm actually a third generation Rutgers alum. My dad and my grandfather both went to Rutgers too. My dad still goes and braves it at the football games every year. <laughs> um, and again, thank you for having me. Um, I actually um, started at Rutgers and I thought I wanted to be a journalist. And I kind of started down the path of journalism. And after a few classes and some work on the Daily Targum, I realized that uh, journalism wasn't quite the path that I wanted to be on, but I knew I wanted to write, I wanted to do communications. So I found my way to PR um, and I took a class um, at Rutgers where we had a professor who was actually from at and I just messaged Ron. I was like, I don't know if you're my professor or not. <laughs> um, where we the, the whole class was built around strategic planning for a company and you had to choose the brand that you wanted to work on. And then you had to build a portfolio with a tax, tactical execution that paired with your strategy. And that's where I kind of realized this is what I want to do. Um, and I built a portfolio that I was able to use in my job searches after I graduated. And the other thing that I got from skills that I think really set me on the course of my career was I was in a mentorship program through the School of Communication. And I was paired up with the head of um, PR for Edelman which is um, you know, a global, the, probably the top global PR agency. And he didn't have time to mentor me. So instead he gave me an internship so everyone in his team could mentor me. And it was probably one of the best things that ever happened as far as just the alumni network reaching back into the community and the school and helping because that internship at Edelman, I mean, having that name on your resume opened a lot of doors for me. And it gave me a lot of really critical experience on being on the ground in consumer, I was in consumer health um, in my internship, and I got my first job in PR in an agency at Hill and Knowlton um, shortly after I graduated in the healthcare PR space. And then I moved around, um, went to another agency after a few years at Hill and Knowlton, and I actually really fell into automotive. Um, I was working at an agency I hadn't joined long before the recession started, and they cut a lot of their staff, including me. And I was a bit lost temporarily. And then I got contacted by um, another agency and they said, look, we don't really have a job for you, but if you wanna go sit at GM down the road, they need a bit of help. They're in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> um, so I went um, and to their office, not even knowing what the job was or what exactly I was gonna be doing or who I was gonna work with. But at the time I just thought I'll give it a go. Um, and I went in and actually the project was to do GM's IPO after the bankruptcy of the business. So that was my first project um, back at GM. And then I got put onto an executive rotation program where I worked um, in different roles through GM. So I was at a manufacturing plant for a couple of years. I was on the global product team. And then I found my way to Australia on my own. I met my husband who was living here and we met through work and I came here and started working on the Holden business and then transitioned to the global job that I'm in today. So a very winding road to where I am now. <laughs> Great, uh, thank you so much. Okay, all right, Mike, you can go now. We won't, we won't let Mark talk to you. <laughs> well, Steve, uh, I, I'm really honored and, and touched to be asked to be here tonight. Uh, I look at our school with great love 
and I see it as kind of the launch pad of my dreams. And I got to Rutgers as a 17 year old kid, uh, opened the Daily Targum, one of my first days on campus and saw the WRSU FM was looking for people to do everything. And uh, I remember kind of folding the paper in front of my face and going, you mean I could be on the radio? How cool is that? Uh, and so that started a love affair with broadcast. Um, and I did sports with my friend now, Professor Mark Beal, Gordon Deal, a bunch of great people, um, which was fantastic because it got me in front of a live microphone. Uh, and I'll never forget, my mom was in a store in downtown Westfield, my hometown, and she hears like, oh, football game. Huh, Rutgers football game. That sounds like my son. Oh, that is my son. And um, so that was kind of a cool moment when I was like 18 or 19. Um, I realized from looking around the country that just about every school had uh, journalism and or communication majors. And so I felt like if I was going to get a job in this business, I would probably better figure out how to stand out from the crowd, if at all possible. And so I interned as much as possible, volunteered. Um, and uh, I'm grateful to my parents because my dad was a civil engineer. My mom worked on Wall Street and they said, Michael, what's your passion? And I said, I think the news. And they were news junkies. We had three papers in the driveway and I think I ate my Cheerios to WCBS News Radio 88. Um, and so it was all around me and uh, I found it fascinating. And my mom and dad said, you should chase your dream. And so uh, I was working as a production assistant at WWOR TV in Secaucus, New Jersey, after an internship there and sending out tapes all across the country. And one day a news director from Midland, Odessa, Texas called and told my dad that I would get to do everything and they'd pay me 14 five a year. And so um, I moved to the home of Friday Night Lights and learned that high school football is king and uh, everybody called me Jersey because of my uh, home state. And so they would say, Jersey, go to the rodeo, come back with a story. Jersey, go to the ostrich festival, come back with a story. And like they kept initiating me time and time and time again. Um, but I took every day as an opportunity to sharpen my skills, to get better. And uh, from there it was on to Waco, Texas. Um, and then I got to Austin, Texas. Uh, spring of 1994, I was the new weekend anchor. And my news director pulled me in one day and with the five o'clock anchor, who was a new hire as well, and said to the five o'clock anchor, you're going to cover the Ann Richards campaign. And then she looked at me and she said, you're going to cover the George W. Bush campaign. He'll never beat Ann Richards, but it'll be good exposure for you. And after the rodeo, the ostrich festival, uh, you know, stories in the cotton patch and the oil field, I was just excited to do the governor's race. Um, and then election night 94, I was sitting there interviewing Carl Rove and Karen Hughes. And the next day, my boss said, you're no longer our weekend anchor. And I said, well, what does that mean? She goes, well, you were the first TV reporter on the bus with George W. Bush. So you're our political correspondent. Okay. So I did that for a couple of years. Um, and then I went off to Los Angeles. And I thought, wow, I made it TV news because I made it to market two after starting in market 150. And it was pretty miserable, to be honest. I went from calling, covering all things Texas politics to being the kid reporter in a major market station who got sent to the meth lab explosion, the you know terrible car chase, uh, awful crime stories. And I get calls in the live truck saying, you know, why don't you have the crying mother soundbite? And I just thought like, I cannot look myself in the mirror if I knock on the door of somebody who suffered a tremendous tragedy and and say to them, how do you feel? Well, what do you mean, how do I feel? You know. And so um, I told my agent at that point that if this is making it in TV news, I'm gonna get out. And he said, whoa, 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 hold on a second. You have a window coming up in your contract. Let me see what I can do. Literally a couple of weeks later, he called me and said, tell them you're leaving. And I said, Larry, where am I going? I haven't interviewed with anybody. I mean, to be the weekend anchor in Waco, Texas, making 17 grand, I had an interview. And he said, you're going to Fox News. They just launched. They like you. They've seen your tape. They just want to know, do you want to live in Los Angeles or Chicago? And so it was a weird feeling to quit a job at a broadcast station 
to join a cable news startup that you'd never seen and where you'd never met anybody. Uh, but that started a journey almost 26 years ago. And as Steve said at the top, I, um, I'm living beyond my dream because I've traveled the world. Um, my initial dream was to make it back to the New York market so mom and dad could watch me every night on the news. Uh, they did get to watch me every night, but I was you know, across the country and around the globe and I am forever grateful. So I am thrilled to be here tonight and I've probably taken too much time, um, but I'm excited to be here. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Mike. Nicole, please. Absolutely. It's again, it's great to be here. Um, I think the first thing I'll make uh, two corrections to my bio. Um, we all know how quickly things change. Um, I neglected to uh, mention in the bio that I had the distinct honor of being the uh, Sky Distinguished Alumni earlier this year. So that was definitely um, a highlight and definitely uh, an honor to uh, receive that recognition from a place that means so much to me. Um, and also, uh, and uh, Dr. Turok alluded to this earlier, um, I was just promoted to full professor. So uh, that will take effect in January 23. Uh, and certainly um, my background uh, and all of, all of the things I learned in my three degrees at Rutgers uh, certainly has helped me get to this point. Um, and, you know, listening to Lauren and listening to Mike, I think, you know, it really, um, hits home in terms of one of the things that I always think about with Sky and with Rutgers uh, is the people. And so when I got to Rutgers, much like Mike, I think I was 17 as well, maybe turning 18 that fall, um, I was uh, enrolled in the pharmacy school over on Bush campus and very quickly failed out of that. And so it was like, what, what do I do now, right? Um, and so after some research, you know, I figured out that you know, this, this library thing might be a good, good way to go. Uh, and I remember my sophomore year, I went uh, into Sky, I believe it was on the third floor, uh, where the LIS department was at the time and talked to Joan Chabrick and said, I wanna enroll in the, grad, in the library program. And, you know, I know she probably thought I was just so cute. She's like, you have to graduate from undergrad first. Um, and I said, well, you know, what do I need? What do I need to do? And she said, well, you know, you can just go downstairs and enroll in the communication department. So I went downstairs and talked to Alma Blount and enrolled in the communication program. Um, and so I went into library school. I went right back to the third floor as soon as I graduated from communication. Um, and so that was 97. And then I graduated from library school in 99. Uh, I started my career as a public librarian. I was a children's librarian. Um, very quickly decided that uh, children, those are not my people. Um, so I actually went from uh, Montclair Public to, um, that was the first job, and I went to what was formerly known as the University of Medicine and Dentistry in Newark. Uh, and so I was in their medical library for a little bit. Um, and I spent most of my time at Montclair State, um, back up in Essex County, and I was an academic librarian for about 10 years. And then I decided uh, that I was coming back for the PhD. So I came back in 2008 and graduated in 2012. Um, and just, you know, thinking about, um, again, the people I remember, um, and Steve, obviously Steve will know all of these people. Um, I saw Todd Hunt's name on the opening slideshow and I hadn't thought about Dr. Hunt in years. Um, I had Dr. Hunt, I had uh, Stan Dietz, um, and I remember thinking I was going to die in Stan Dietz's uh, communication theory class. Um, it ended up being uh, one of my favorite things uh, that I, you know, had in my career at Rutgers. And then when I came back uh, to uh, the MLIS program, um, I had David Carr. Um, I think Betty was on, I think Betty was ALA uh, president at that point. Um, but I had Nick Belkin, I had Carol Kulthow, I had, you know, these uh, enormous leaders in librarianship. Um, and I was in their classes um, and, I, and I knew, you know, what that was at the time, uh, but certainly, you know, out in the field and in the profession, you realize, oh, I was in classes with, you know, literally living legends. So it was, it was it's, you know, always a, a, a point of pride to say that I graduated with my uh, library degree from Rutgers. And then when I got back for the PhD, 
Nick was still there. Paul Cantor was still there. So, you know, the people um, in the community of Sky um, is very significant and had people there um, that I've had, you know, through all three degrees. I had Jenny Mandelbaum through all three degrees, right? Um, and, you know, had a communication minor while I was in the PhD program. And so, you know, also thinking about the interdisciplinarity in the truest sense of the word. And I think that that's been um, very beneficial to me uh, as a faculty member and being able to uh, move between disciplines. Um, and now, you know, the, I, the school that I'm in is, has a sister school uh, with uh, the School of Journalism. And, you know, a lot of uh, library schools are merging with different departments and, you know, folks are a little, maybe a little reticent. And so Rutgers is actually one of the models um, that a lot of programs look at to say that Rutgers for 40 years has had librarianship combined with communication, com combined with journalism and mass media. So um, I think in that way, we, we were definitely ahead of the curve uh, with that. So yeah, I think about the people, I think about the rigor, um, and that's been, you know, just really, um, really beneficial. Um, and so then after the PhD, I finished that in 2012. And I had my first faculty job at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. So I earned tenure there. And then after seven years there, I came here to South Carolina, uh, where Steve mentioned I am the Augusta Baker Endowed Chair. Um, and it, the, my position is named after a Black children's librarian that spent 40 years at the New York Public Library. So I'm having an amazing time, uh, you know, highlighting her legacy, uh, extending her legacy. She was uh, an author, she was a social justice advocate, she was a master storyteller. And so I spend a lot of time, um, obviously, teaching. Um, I've created several classes, uh, social justice storytelling, uh, critical cultural information studies, um, and they're all equity, diversity, inclusion, social justice type classes. And I have infused that into my service, my research, and my teaching. Um, and for the uh, Augusta Baker Endowed Chair, we do lots of programs. I'm particularly proud of the programs that we do. Um, we have a catalog of probably about 50 programs uh, since I've been here. And we just have webinars and we have uh, folks from the field that come in and talk to the students about what they do in the field. And I'm, we make all of that available free online. Uh, and I've had you know messages from uh, professors all over the country saying, you know, thank you for putting this out there so we can incorporate uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion into our programs. So that's where I'm at. Um, like I said, um, it hasn't quite hit me yet about full professor. I'm sure once I finish grading this semester, um, I can take some time to enjoy that um, and think about, you know, what the next step is. But like I said, um, definitely uh, my three degrees and my experience at Rutgers has uh, gotten me to this point. So it is always an honor to come back and talk and say thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, before I uh, let Ron speak, um, Nicole points to something that I think um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, but um, I think it's important that in addition to celebrating not only the school and our professors and our faculty, um, celebrating the what our staff members have done over the years, um, you know, not just Alma Blunt and Joan Shabrak and Angela DiMartini, but um, my student, my student and alum Amy Keach is here reminds me that she worked for Marsha Bergman, and all the wonderful people who have helped us along the way, and we could not do our jobs without them. Now, you know, the people, you know, Nella and Fran, and all the people in the dean's office now. And you know, we tend to forget a lot of times that uh, these are the people who are the backbone of the school who keep, the, who keep everything going. So I just wanted to uh, say thank you to all of them too. And um, I know that um, a lot of you who have graduated from our programs have had similar and wonderful um, relationships with those people. Um, Ron? Thank you, good evening to everyone. And Thanks again for inviting me to participate in this panel. 
Um, in these few brief moments, I'd like to just highlight several accounts of how I came to the profession of librarianship, um, which was a second career for me, actually. So uh, first, you have to understand that librarianship was a totally new profession for me. I had no background in librarianship, libraries, other than being an occasional user. Um, as Steve mentioned, my first career was at AT&T Bell Laboratories, where I was a software developer, um, later managed a department of some 45 people, um, all of whom were writing some kind of software. Um, in 1996, I had an opportunity to take a buyout from AT&T. Um, I took the opportunity and enrolled immediately in the MLS program. In fact, um, my buyout was effective on Friday. On Monday morning, I was in Pat Reeling's general reference course. Um, so uh, this was probably, by the way, one of the best decisions I have ever made in my life. I didn't know it at the time. I could talk at length about the various opportunities that the school has offered me. Um, I had a lot of great instructors. Um, I'll mention a few. Um, first, <clears throat> I took Professor Yana Varley's field experience course. And in this course, I actually worked at, in the Ge Geosciences Library at Princeton University for a semester. Um, I wrote an article about my experience. And uh, later, Yana came to me and said she thought the article was publishable and pointed me to a journal. I submitted the article and it was accepted. So you might not think this is really a big deal, but this experience actually got me started on research and publishing, which became an integral part of my later library profession. I also, I had a lot of great courses in the MLS program. I actually took three courses from Professor Tefko Sarasovic. Um, some students actually warned me against this, by the way, um, noting that some of his courses could be a little on the difficult side. Um, I got through his three courses. Um, I graduated with the MLS. And um, I took a position at Rutgers University Libraries in Alexander Library, first um, serving for roughly 10 years, I believe, as the social science data librarian, and later as the um, uh, digital library architect. Um, <clears throat> I had heard, by the way, that some library administrators didn't want to hire me. Um, because I didn't have any library experience. And I also heard later from a colleague that uh, Tefco had given me a really strong recommendation. And I think probably his recommendation uh, was a significant factor in me uh, getting a position at, um, at Alexander Library. <laughs> so um, Tefco also um, urged me to continue my studies in the, in, in the PhD program, which I did. Um, I focused um, my dissertation on a quantitative study, uh, which involved something, um, a statistical procedure called hierarchical regression analysis. So, uh, mind you, I have a master's degree in mathematics. Um, However, I pointedly avoided statistics. And so at this point, I just want to acknowledge and thank uh, Professor Dan O'Connor for helping me negotiate some fairly difficult statistical problems. Um, I did get the PhD, as Steve mentioned, I published a book about innovation and creativity in research libraries. Um, this was a great experience for me. I wanted to highlight one other 
what I think fairly significant aspect of um, the school and my work at Alexander Library. Um, in, <clears throat> in the early 1990s, I began working with um, some of the faculty in library school to set up a program where students um, could work in the scholarly communication center um, for three hours credit, working on various digital projects. Uh, scholarly Commun communication center at that time was part of um, Alexander Library. And for a good part of the next 20 years, we had a steady flow of students from the library school uh, working for three hours credit um, and uh, frequently staying on working part time. And there's a couple of things that I think are really um, notable about this. First of all, a number of these projects that the students worked on are actually part of the uh, Rutgers University Library's infrastructure and their digital collections. Um, uh, notable is the institutional repository, referred to as RU Core, and one of the really very special digital collections of students worked to digitize the Roman coin collection held by special collections, and um, they provided extensive metadata. This really unique collection now is available free to the public and to the world. It's really, if you're interested in classics and Roman coins, you should take a look at it. The other thing I wanna say is that um, uh, at least five of the students working on these various projects are now academic librarians at major research uh, universities. It's um, a program I think has been a great experience for students moving on into librarianship. Um, so I, I just, in closing, um, it occurred to me that I have been associated with the school on and off for like 25 years. Um, the school has opened up a lot of opportunities for me and I really appreciate the great relationship. Uh, I hope to keep it going. Um, by continuing in the role as president of the communication and <clears throat> School of Communication and Information Alumni Association. And I just want to uh, uh, pick up a point that Nicole mentioned. Um, uh, the association hosts the uh, Distinguished Alumni event, um, and we will be doing it again in April. And the department the candidate we will be honoring will be from the um, from journalism and media studies. So that will occur in April. So that concludes my comments. Thanks for listening. And you're all member. And if you've graduated from our school, you are a member of the Alumni Association, um, which is what Ron tells everybody <laughs> every graduation. Twenty eight thousand of us. That's right. So. So, Rosie, it's your turn, please. Thanks so much for inviting me uh, to this. I'm, I'm really very grateful. Um, you know, there's so many things that I'm grateful to Rutgers and Sky for. Uh, I, I really truly feel that they were the primary building blocks in my career in broadcast journalism, and they continue to be a part of my journey. Um, you know, at Rutgers and Sky, I, I learned early on that anything is possible if you have the desire and will to go after it. Uh, when I did my internship at Rutgers, uh, I had interned at a local radio station in Plainfield, New Jersey that nobody had ever heard of. Um, I ended up doing a 10 part series on illiteracy and I put a lot of time into that series and it ended up winning an award from the Associated Press. So of course, you know, as a college student, I was, I thought I was on top of the world. Um, I owed that award to my intern coordinator, who was Roger Cohen, who had said to me that if you wanna get your hands dirty and get out there and cover stories, think small, think of a local radio station, don't go with the big guys. And you know what, Roger was right. 
um, I was learning so much and gaining so much experience from that. And I'm eternally grateful to him for his advice. Um, you know, another thing too that I learned uh, through Rutgers and Sky was the importance of making connections. Um, I was working as a news director at WRSU. Uh, the station had a broadcast coordinator who was named Jerry Donnelly. And I remember it was senior year and spring semester had just started and I had no job prospects at all. And the only thing I could think of at that time was my parents are going to kill me. Um, Jerry had reached out to me and said that Dow Jones in Princeton needed someone for some temporary work editing audio tape. So uh, of course I jumped at it. Uh, so, so what started off as a temporary job that was only supposed to last maybe two to three months ended up becoming a full-time job that lasted eight years. And when I left that job, I was an audio text newscaster. So basically that was, you got all your information over the phone. So you, that, that was a long time ago. Um, but because they were closing that division, I decided it was time for me to follow my passion for television news. And I moved into their television unit in, in New York. And I had to start at the bottom as a production assistant, but I thought, you know, if I don't take this opportunity now, it may never come again. So I became a PA. Um, a couple of years into my job uh, with the Dow Jones Wall Street Journal TV group, uh, one of my old bosses from my Dow Jones job in Princeton called me and asked me if I wanted to come into CNN, where he was working at the time, to interview for an associate producer job. And I turned him down. I told him um, the reason was because I was getting married in a few months from the, the, you know, when we had this conversation and I was also finishing up graduate school. So I felt I, I just had too much going on. I just remember after I got off the phone with him, I, I wanted to, I, I was so upset with myself because I felt I had given up my golden opportunity and I was embarrassed to call him back, you know, and tell him, Hey, I made a mistake. Can you reconsider me? Um, so I thought, okay, well, let me just focus on what's happening in my life now. And I'll, you know, remain a production assistant for a little while longer. And the following is not an exaggeration. About a year later, my old boss calls me again and asks me, did you get married? And I said, yes. And he, he asked me, did you get your degree? And I said, yes. He said, okay, well, now you can come in for an interview. And that's how I started my career at CNN. Um, the first day on the job, I was being trained by a producer who still works there and happens to be a Rutgers alum. And of course, I took that as a great sign that this was where, where I was meant to be. So I'm so grateful for the connection that I still have with my old boss. He's retired now, but we still keep in touch. Um, when I started at CNN, I was producing business updates for uh, CNN, CNN International, and Headline News, which later became HLN. Uh, I had also produced several business shows, too. Um, and when CNN shut down their uh, financial news division, I moved over to Headline News and covered crime news and worked on Nancy Grace for several years and then Crime and Justice with Ashley Banfield. So when Ashley's show got canceled, it gave me time to think about the next steps I wanted to take in my career. And I realized I wanted to stay in television, but I wasn't so sure I wanted to continue working as a producer. I, I felt I put in a lot of time. You know, I, I kind of started doing that right out of Rutgers. Um, but again, because of the networking I learned at Sky and the importance of keeping, making and keeping those connections, my current boss that I have now reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to come in for an interview for a management position with CNN's business administration team. So I've known my current boss for many years, but I never worked with her when I was producing. And when she initially called me, uh, she said, no one knows what it's like to deal with on-air talent and show teams better than you. And this time, when I was asked about coming in for an interview, I definitely said yes. And this is the job I currently hold. And um, like Steve had said in, in my introduction, I do lead a team of talent executive assistants and business coordinators 
who support the day side and primetime talent at CNN and, and their respective show teams. Um, sometimes people say to me or they'll ask me, what, what do you exactly do? So we work closely with the accounting team, finance, HR, um, IT, travel, and legal to provide administrative support to talent. And basically what we do is we translate production speak to corporate and we cut through the corporate red tape for the production teams. Ultimately, you know, I, I guess that you could call me a fixer and the person that you go to when you need an answer without the BS. Um, and that's basically me in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to open the floor up for anybody who has a question. Please um, use your raise your hand so we can, um, just like Amy just raised her uh, clapping, which is very nice. Thank you. Um, if you have a question, please, um, for our panelists. Okay, well, then I'll start. Fine. Um, what is, I mean, you've mentioned all these things about being at Rutgers. Do you have one specific class that you felt and one or, and or one specific professor that you felt um, gave you the motivation to go on uh, your journey? Any, and any of the panelists can answer that. I can start, Steve. For me, you know, it was Roger Cohen. He he taught my uh, radio production class, which I absolutely loved. Um, and he was my intern coordinator. And he was just he he motivated me so much. I I really miss him. You know, I just I I feel like he was such a great asset to the school. So it was radio production and Roger Cohen for me. Um, just as an aside before anybody else, Roger passed away earlier this year. Um, he taught at the university for over 30 years. He was the play-by-play -play on the 1975 70, uh, 75, uh, championship team um, and worked at the Athletic Center. And he was just the backbone of our department in broadcast journalism for many years. Mike? Steve, I, 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 can, you, Ron. I can jump in on this. Uh, sure. When I started in the MLS program, um, January 1996, uh, David Carr um, had an introductory meeting for um, incoming students. I actually think there were about 300 of us. Um, I was amazed at the number of people. But David mentioned um, that would, we would be hearing from international scholars, in particular, um, uh, Tefko Sarasovic and Nick Belkin. Um, I had two really great courses, Human Inv Information Behavior from Tefko and Information Retrieval from Nick. Um, and uh, both of those got me really uh, immersed in information science. I can uh, step in now. Um... So I think um, instead of a class, I'll talk about a person in a subject area. Um, and it, I'm gonna talk, mention Ross Todd, Dr. Ross Todd. Um, so my first year in the PhD program, I think I had gotten through the first semester and I just had no idea what was happening. Um, I didn't think I could do it. And I remember going to uh, Marie Radford who was the uh, area coordinator for the uh, library students at the time for the PhD. And I said, I'm, I'm going to go back to work. I, I can't do this. I don't know what anybody's saying. And she and a couple other people had said, um, you know, wait for Ross to come back. I think he was on sabbatical uh, that first semester. And I met him at um, probably one of the colloquium sessions. And he said, you know, I heard that I should meet you. And, you know, we had a conversation and, you know, you all know that he was uh, school libraries and I was coming from an academic library. And I remember him very specifically saying to me, if you want to stay, I will work with you and I will make this work for you. And he said, I don't know anything about what you do. You don't know anything about what I do, but we can meet each other halfway. 
And, and that's what we did. And he is the one who introduced me to information behavior that uh, Ron just mentioned. And I'm still doing information behavior. It turned out to be uh, one of my favorite things. And, you know, just again, the people um, in, the, in the really the, the community. I remember my first impression of uh, Todd Hunt was that he seemed to be having a better time than everybody else. Um, so I was inspired by his passion for what he was doing. Uh, I remember Roger Cohen uh, and all the great contributions he made to our wonderful school. Uh, and I also had a couple of interesting adjunct instructors who had some interesting um, professional experiences of their own that kind of brought it to the classroom and, and made it real. Uh, there was a guy named Bernard Schussman uh, many moons ago who was uh, a news director at WNBC TV. And so, you know, when I saw the guy who was like running News for New York, uh, I hung on his every word. And then there was a, a PR professional named Kevin Kelly, I think he was, and he talked about some of the, you know, crisis PR of um, the Tylenol. Um, tampering scandal back in the day. And so I, I had the interesting experience of imagining what it would be like to be on the PR team. But at the same time, I was also thinking what it would be like to be a reporter asking tough questions of Tylenol, um, j, j officials. So um, I, I'm so grateful to uh, those who, who took the time to teach me. And, um, and I think the other thing that was interesting about the school was at least back in my era, um, you guys didn't baby us. You made it clear that there were opportunities out there. Um, and, and I think that served us well in the real world where you, you have to keep your eyes open and look for great opportunities. And so I'm also grateful for that. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to jump in and answer. I, um, I mentioned it earlier and I actually remember the professor's name all of a sudden, Jack Grasso taught the class um, that I was talking about where we, he sort of set a strategy out for us and how to build the strategy and then a tactical execution um, for each part of our strategy and then helped us build a portfolio um, that we could use to kind of set us out into the world. And he was a great professor and his real world experience was really valuable to me. Um, and it sort of set me on the course that I'm on now. Um, so yeah, that class was, was really important for me. I'm so happy that um, Nicole, met, Nicole mentioned uh, Ross and that Lauren, you mentioned Jack. Um, Jack, yeah. Ross and uh, Roger, we lost all of them much too soon and they, their contributions are just immeasurable to what they did for our students and for the school. Um, just so you know, Lauren, um, Jack's successor, uh, Professor Mark Beal is on the phone call today. Um, okay. he's, he's carrying on Jack's tradition uh, so nicely and so well. It's, it's just wonderful to watch. So um, just let you know about that. Um, Thank you. Steve, anybody? may I take a moment to praise you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean that. Why? I mean that. I mean that very heartfelt and very sincerely, Steve. You do an unbelievable job of connecting Rutgers students with people in the broadcast news industry. You are a treasure, and I know I'm embarrassing you right now, but you also do an unbelievable job of making your alums feel like we're still part of the family. And so, thank you. Well. Um, if you said that to my family, they'd say, oh, he's a treasure. Let's bury him. Um, <laughs> but th thank you, Mike, for your very kind words. Um, I'll just say I happen to have uh, four of our alums speak to my 102 class today. And I'll say to you the same thing I said to them, which is um, when young people come into our school and uh, into our university and they spend four years here at that point in their lives, it's about 20 percent of their lives. So if they're investing 20% of their lives in us, we should be investing in them longer than that. So we want to go with that. And so their students are what's important. Um, Alexander, you have a question. Yeah, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, Alexander Coward here, uh, 2020 graduate of the School of Sky. Uh, I was an information technology and informatics major. My question I want to kind of 
pivot off something Mike brought up um, when he mentioned Johnson & Johnson and the whole Tylenol issue back in the 80s, I believe. But I wanted to know from your experience, what was maybe a pivotal moment that maybe could have made or uh, broken your career or maybe could have you could have decided to leave or choose something else? Maybe it was an external crisis, 2008, or uh, a big story that you covered, or maybe an internal crisis to your personal life. I would love to hear you expand upon um, something um, in, in your past experience that really was an inflection point in your career. Thank you for the question. Um, I worried when I left family and all of my friends uh, from New Jersey to go to small town Texas, whether I'd be able to do it. All I had you know, done in terms of my life was live by exit 135 or on the Rutgers campus my entire life. And so moving to West Texas was a little bit scary. And I thought I might wake up in six months and say like, this is not for me. And, and I felt like at that point, if it didn't work out, at least I would know that I, that I tried. I, I kind of had a recurring nightmare of being like my age now with a house and a white picket fence sitting in front of the TV, wanting to throw the remote through the TV, thinking like that would have, should have, could have been me, but I didn't have the courage to do it. And so I, I'm grateful that I went for it. Um, I, I was not happy in Los Angeles and local news uh, chasing death and destruction and awful crime stories. Um, that was not why I got in the news business. And so I really thought about like, if this is making it TV news, maybe it's time to go do something else. And was doing some serious soul searching at that point. Um, over the last 25, 26 years at Fox, it's been one mega story after another. Um, you know, when you see colleagues from our network or others get killed or seriously wounded covering war, um, you start to think about this is not, you know, just glamour and, and um, cool storytelling. There, you know, there are some brave people who are paying a heavy price to tell the truth, to tell the story. And so that certainly. Um, can lead to some soul searching. And I've I spent time in Afghanistan and Iraq, and um, I'm a better journalist for it because I got to see those things for myself. Uh, but I certainly did not take for granted the fact that I made it home in one piece while a lot of other people do not. Um, I have a similar, not, not certainly going to Afghanistan, but I had a similar sort of inflection point. Um, I was approached by GM early in my career. I had done a few years in the regional office doing financial and grassroots and kind of dealer comms. And they came and said, you know, all roads lead to Detroit. And um, if you want to have a career in GM, uh, we need you to make some moves around the business and try some different types of PR. Um, you need to have the understanding of all of the ways that our business operates, not just, you know, what you're doing now and they came and asked me to move from New York City to rural Kansas and um, I went kicking and screaming because I just couldn't envision myself living in Kansas it was like the farthest place from my mind of places I imagined myself living um, but I went anyway because I knew it was something I needed to do for my career and it was one of the best experiences I've had in communications I was you know, like 25 years old and running um, a communications internally and externally for thousands of employees at the plant, working with the UAW, doing events in the community where the entire community is built around the plant and the fact that most of the people live and work in that community work at the plant. Um, it was a really important uh, point in my career to make the decision to move and do something that felt out of my comfort zone, but also something personally that felt challenging, like, was I going to like it there? How was I going to, you know, live my everyday life the way that I wanted to in a place that I couldn't envision myself living? And I moved, you know, three or four more times since then. And I think being willing 
to take those calculated risks and to go out of your comfort zone and to go somewhere that maybe you thought you didn't want to go or you for a role you didn't want to try. Sometimes there's the most education in those opportunities. Um, Kansas ended up being a beautiful place to live. I loved it. Um, and I loved the job at the plant, even though I really thought I wouldn't. And, you know, when I did move to Michigan and then ultimately to Australia, um, each time, with it, you know, you're starting over somewhere new, it's personally challenging, but it's also challenging for work and for networking. And so sometimes I think it's the biggest test of yourself, but you also gain the most from those. So I, I'm totally with Mike. I think sometimes making those big moves and taking those calculated risks are where you get the most personal growth. Well done. Nicole, Rosie, Ron, do you want to answer that too? I think just really quickly, um, thinking about what Lauren said, um, up until I finished the PhD, you know, born and raised in Jersey, three degrees at Rutgers, um, had not been anywhere. And so, you know, the opportunity came up to move to Illinois and I almost turned it down. Um, and then, you know, Betty and the folks, they were like, oh no, you have to go. Um, and it turned out to be the best thing. Um, Rosie? I think for me, it was probably, um, I guess, covering 9 11, because um, it just made me second guess whether or not I wanted to actually continue in broadcast journalism. Um, I just remember it, it was like nonstop working 24 7. You know, it was just, I think it got to a point where. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And then after just taking some rest, realizing that I still had a story to tell um, and, and that's what I wanted to do. And, and, you know, I focused on that. Um, so for me, that's, that was kind of a little bit of a turning point because I almost decided I don't want to do this anymore and realized, like I said, I, I still have a story to tell people. So, I get the feeling that all you know, it's it's funny. All these um, stories are very instructive because I think we, um, Alexander, because we all all of us at some point in our life, you know, uh, come to that crossroads, uh, you know, where we have to decide whether we're going to keep on doing what we're doing or go in another direction. And um, what our guests today have done is. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, thank you for sharing that with us because you know, they're very important and great, great life lessons for all of us. So um, I see by the clock that um, unfortunately um, our allotted time is done. Um, this has been wonderful. It's, as I said at the beginning of this, this has been quite an honor for me. Uh, but before I go, I want to thank uh, our Dean, Dr. Lemish, uh, Brenda Sheridan, um, Rosa Nima for setting this all up and having giving us the space to celebrate uh, this wonderful school that has contributed so, so much to so many people's lives. Um, and it's been it's done that for 40 years and hopefully will continue for 40 and 40 after that. So thank you very much. And um, I want to get uh, Lauren's frequent Zoomer miles for this call um, and be able to share it. Um, and once again, I want to thank all of you for showing up and sh sharing this with us. Um, and that's it, everybody. Have a wonderful night. Have a wonderful holiday season. Um, please stay in touch because, as I say to all my students, um, this isn't a school. This is your home. So please come home again. <laughs>